The day today is also is very important. We have a very beautiful bunch of speakers, experts, professionals from the space ecosystem lined up for today's conference. We will cover way forward with the academia industry partnership in space science applications. In the session two, our speakers will be informing our audience throughout the Islamic world and beyond about the development of space ecosystem to ensure the food security, boost agriculture, and reduce the poverty. The session third will cover the relationship of telecommunication, cybersecurity, and space science. We will be ended up with a consultative session with Christina Korb and two astronauts. Uh, Dr. Sian Heiler Proctor, who was just in September in a space, and we have another uh, very important uh, personality present with us today, rather two personalities very important uh, for, from the space science, Dr. Anas Imran and Dr. Engineer Majid Olanesi, who will also furnish us in this, uh, in this uh, session, the last session. Without any exception and doubt, the space is the next frontier whose boundaries we have to conquer, and in doing so, a number of new technologies will be created. Ladies and gentlemen, this Global Space Science Forum 2021 is being organized with the Space Foundation, and uh, Space Foundation is a global resource for education, teacher training, and many other things in, in education. I am pleased to introduce to you our today's first speaker, His Excellency Professor Dries Awesha, former Minister Delegate in Charge of Higher Education and Scientific Research. His Excellency Dries Awesha was named the President of Al Ahrain University by His Majesty King Mohammed VI in December 2008. He has been previously serving at Al Ahrain as a Vice President of Academic Affairs, Interim Dean of School of Business Administration, and Dean of School of Humanities and Social Sciences. His Excellency Oesha has also been the Executive Director of the Scholarship and Dean of School of Humanities and Mole Ismail University in Meknes and General Secretary of Moroccan British Society and the Secretary of Euromed Permanent University Forum. His Excellency holds a PhD in Linguistic and Education from the University of Texas at Austin, Master in Applied Linguistics and Language, teaching from the University of the Wales United Kingdom, before being appointed Minister in Charge of Higher Education and Scientific Research. Excellency was the Dean, Vice President, and then the President of Al Ahrain University in Afran. Please join me to welcome His Excellency for his today's the opening speech, the University Leadership and Academic Industry Partnership. Ladies and gentlemen, I give the floor to His Excellency, Dr. Avesha. Thank you very much. Um, Director General Dr. Salim Al Malik, Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, I am pleased to speak at ICESCO for a second time in a year on university and space science. At last June symposium, I concluded my address by saying, we need to empower scientific fields in general, give more support to space sciences and bring our scientists back home, offering them the environment, ecosystem and support that they need to invest in their own country's research and reduce the Muslim scientists' brain migration. And in order to move forward, we need to, one, strengthen our scientific field dedicated to the domain, science, engineering, and technology, enhance structures, which would undoubtedly be of great benefit, particularly through scientific exchanges, mobility, and joint research projects, bring the International Associated Laboratories, LIA model, around joint research projects, which would help meet many objectives and socioeconomic contributions of space applications, opportunities related to technological benefits and skill transfer. Most would agree that this is easier said than done, 
as we witness the race to space speed up tremendously and the private sector putting in big funds and competition. This year alone, we have seen three private successful attempts at space travel undertaken by wealthy businessmen. Travel to the International Space Station and back for NASA on a private spaceship flying the mission. How can this spirit of collaboration be transferred to academia industry relationship? What leadership can contribute to its success? Academic leadership is complex. Success at it requires multiple roles. Vision developer from institutional mission, catalyst, broker, coach, fundraiser, entrepreneur. Out of the institution's mission, the leader needs to develop a vision, share it with all the stakeholders, and ensure buy-in from most of them. In space science, the vision needs to be broken down into goals and objectives for which the sky is the limit. As a catalyst, the academic leader needs to inspire faculty to think out of the box, to encourage originality, creativity, and innovation. Different ideas and projects often gain from coming together, working together, and when possible, serve a bigger goal that unites efforts and provides direction for a bigger purpose. The leader coordinates, and when projects run into difficulty or crisis, he works to provide light at the end of a tunnel, similar to a sports coach. Words of encouragement and positive feedback can go a long way in sustaining effort, determination, and possible victory. As a leader of an academic institution involved in space science, one has to know enough of the field to be able to negotiate with industry, market projects, and persuade policymakers and fund providers. When disagreements occur between researchers and funders, he needs to broker new agreements. Industry partners need to see in him an understanding, an honest, reliable broker. This skill is sometimes needed to settle differences even among researchers themselves. Support and encouragement from the leader can be most needed in times of crisis. Sometimes the best marketer or salesperson for a research project is the institutional leader. The researchers themselves look to him for support, both moral and material. Unexpected expenses, though small they may be, can impact progress and morale. Space science research is costly, and university budget cannot finance it without support from external funds. Industry leaders need ideas and solutions from academics and the assurance of the institutional CEO to move forward. Fundraising skills, including marketing, salesmanship, and persuasiveness are important attributes to a successful leader. In space science, a higher degree of assurance for achievability and return on investment is needed, as these may well be new untrodden paths, which will take longer and may require repeated attempts. A spirit of entrepreneurship can help all of the above come together. New ideas, new territory, external partners, all need an entrepreneur to put ideas together, to coordinate teams, to constantly find ways and means to continue the collective journey toward the sought goal, the Northern Star as it were. A set of skills, including vision, perseverance, financial savviness, optimism, and being solution-oriented can be most helpful. In recent years, the study of space and space science have prospered with interest from government, university, and industry. Let me give a couple examples from Morocco, probably not very different in nature from other members of ICESCO, but they can serve as sources of inspiration for multiplication. Recently, a very important agreement was signed between 
the Ministry of Higher Education, Mohammed V University, the Royal Center for the Study of Research of Spa and Space, the National Research Center for Science and Technology, and the National Defense Administration. Three main objectives are sought. Training human resources in space technology, sharing experience and disseminating knowledge, and producing nanosatellites dedicated to training in space technology. The, Nas the National Defense Administration industry offered the university two satellites, as well as relevant ground material, one for telecommunications and positioning training, the other for observation of the planet Earth. The training program included units led by practitioners from industry revolving around concept development, unit assembly, launching, and exploiting of nanosatellites and their imagery. This good example of multiplayer collaboration is very promising and provides a convenient platform for training for the African Regional Center for Space Science and Technology as well. With the help of international expertise, Morocco had launched two satellites in 2017 and 2018 for the purposes of telecommunications and observation. This has helped Moroccan researchers and industrials observe and learn from the two cases. It was through these experiences that a number of entities have come together to cooperate, to face the challenge, and to seize the opportunities of space study and exploration, benefiting from the growing interest and innovation the world over. This multi-party, multilateral collaboration is a good example of what is needed today. It has been relatively easy to convince and mobilize faculty and researchers qualified to join the study and promotion of space as curiosity about the interest, uh, as curiosity about an interest in space have intrigued Muslim scholars for a long time. The skies are believed to house the heavens and in some ways control the rain, the sun, and the elements. They also punctuate our lives with the alteration of light and, light and darkness, sun and moon, as well as seasons, temperatures, and impact on Mother Earth. A good coincidence of today's conference, as Co-op 26 is debating climate change, natural disasters, and budgets needed to save our planet, no less than $100 billion a year. This interest has witnessed a strong revival in recent years, leading to interest in astronomy and international collaboration on the observation of the sky. This has led to astronomy clubs among the youth in universities, especially in Rabat, Casablanca, Marrakesh, and Ifran, among others. With the support of academic leadership, these clubs have been coming together yearly in Ifran for a national meeting for exchange, recognition, sky observation, and dissemination among the youth. Bilateral and multilateral collaboration is crucial for the study and exploration of space, be it university industry, public, private, or national, international. For the field is multidimensional and needs sustained heavy funding. The cost of these explorations is extremely high and no one party alone can sustain efforts long enough to achieve substantial results, much less so for universities. Suffice it to indicate that according to the global space economy, NASA's budget for 2020 was over $22 billion, with the world global expenditures for 2017 soaring beyond $260 billion. Today, with over 6,000 satellites in space and about nine, over 90 ones launched each year, this market is booming, generating revenues of over $271 billion in 2019. In spite of its impressive technical, human, and budget resources, NASA has recently decided that with the internet, and I quote, 
With the International Space Station approaching the end of its lifespan, NASA is looking to the private sector to build the next generation of space stations and other space-based destinations for space-based missions and the burgeoning of space tourism. This is an inspiration for all of us. No time to go it alone. Time to share, give and take. ICESCO is well positioned to bring together interesting and interested students, engineers, researchers, industrials, fund providers, and scholars from the Muslim majority countries and beyond, and serve as a platform for space study, exploration, and benefit. It behooves all of us, especially academic leaders, to encourage and incentivize young men and women at early ages when imagination knows few limits, to dream, to deeply believe that the sky is the limit and to shoot for the stars. To move towards this goal, to move towards this goal, concrete actions, operational initiatives are needed and funding is necessary. Hence the suggestion of one, a collective ICESCO space science fund with contributions from member states. Two, a system of recognition and fostering of talent and achievements, which would include prizes for best research, best innovation, best discovery. Pri best prize for most fruitful collaboration, university industry, PPP. Summer schools for young promising talents in space study. And last but not least, training conferences and workshops for academic leadership at all levels. The time is right, the conditions are appropriate, the aptitude is there. We need to work on attitudes to further develop far-sightedness, collaborative spirits, the will to invest long-term and to use existing framework such as ICESCO. Leadership is not innate, it is largely acquired and more opportunities to develop are highly recommended and the sooner the better. Tomorrow belongs to those who prepare for it today. Thank you all for your attention. Thank you, Excellency. Sky the limit and shoot the stars. It is always pleasure and honor to listen such a motivational, knowledgeful speech from Excellency Dresa Vesha, who really makes always this easy, the, the difficult topics easy to understand to our audience and participants, and very nice and the kind suggestions, a proposal for research, best prize, the summer school, and the trainings is really amazing. We, we hope that it, it, we will be working and we will taking the suggestions through our leadership and inshallah we'll do something. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, our next speaker is also very well known and let me have opportunity to introduce him, Dr. Monif. Dr. Monif Zaubi, he's a senior advisor, Interaction Council, co-founder, director, World Sustainability Forum, and his trustee, World Academy of Arts and Sciences. Dr. Zobi has been active in global sustainable development, particularly through science, technology, and innovation for around 30 years. Born in Amman, Jordan, he studied for his undergraduate and postgraduate degrees in civil engineering, technology and management at Brighton and Loughborough Universities in the United Kingdom. Dr. Zawi currently serves as a science advisor to the Interaction Council, which is an independent international organization that mobilizes the experience of a group of former heads of states and statesmen from all over the world. Previously, he worked for the Islamic World Academy of Science, which is an affiliate of Organization of Islamic World, is OIC. Dr. Zobi is a member of many international organizations, including UNESCO, International Center for South-South Cooperation in Science, Technology, and Innovation, ISTIC, the New York Academy of Science, and the World Academy of Arts and Science. He's also a member of University of California International Water Forum. 
Since 2007, he is a member of American Association for the Advancement of Science. Since 2013, he is a member of member and a board of judges for the Templation, Templeton Prize for 2018 to 2021, member of International Advisory Board, Economic Cooperation Organization, Science Foundation. He is also a founding director of the World Sustainability Forum. Your, uh, Dr. Zobi is today is going to speak about the value of science in space exploration, the STI policy elements. Dr. Zobi, we are very much happy to have you today with us virtually. I give the floor to you, please. It's yours. Thank you very much. Uh, good morning uh, uh, to everybody. Assalamu alaikum. Can I have permission to share my screen, please? I'm unable to share my screen. Um, can I have permission to share my screen, please? We allow here. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, and uh, greetings to you all from uh, Jordan. Uh, in this part of the world, it's almost uh, uh, lunchtime. Uh, so I promise I will not take too long in uh, my talk, in which I will try to interweave a number of ideas that hopefully would be of benefit to ICESCO and to the follow-up action that uh, may develop as a result of this uh, Global Space Science Forum. Uh, may I acknowledge also the effort of His Excellency, the Director General of ICESCO and the science and technology team in putting this uh, uh, forum together. Um, I'll try and very quickly address a number of issues related to the policy component of uh, space science and technology or space exploration. This is how my presentation will look like, hopefully. Um, as we are in the Middle East, there is a tremendous sense of history in most of the ideas that we try to develop. So I will, uh, that will be my starting point. And then I will talk about the issues on the global radar, and then try and uh, add to what has been said yesterday by a number of eminent speakers in the domain of science, space science, uh, uh, and technology activities. Let me start with uh, this. This is uh, uh, going back to the 16th century when the Istanbul Observatory was closed down. The Istanbul Observatory, which was looked after by a very eminent scientist at the time. This is Taqiyuddin bin Ma'roof al-Dimashqi. And for many historians of science, the, closing, the closure of the observatory the, around the year 1580 marked the start of a decline of the scientific enterprise in the Islamic world. I say this as a background to the uh, state of uh, science, technology, and innovation in the uh, Muslim, Muslim majority countries or the countries that are member uh, of the ISESCO and, and the OIC. Um, and very quickly move on to today and try and capture the in uh, in terms of science, technology, and innovation uh, in the WANA region, in, uh, uh, in this part of the world, to talk about the human capital or the human resources that we have active in science, technology, and innovation, and cite two examples from the UNESCO science report. 
Uh, I've had the pleasure of being a co-author of the latest UNESCO science report, and this is a slide that I have extracted from the presentation of, um, on that report that talks about human resources. And mention an example from Morocco in terms of human resources capacity building, and mention the School of Digital Engineering and Artificial Intelligence that was founded in Morocco in 2019 in partnership with the Politec Polytechnic School in France. Talk about an initiative in Jordan uh, to launch uh, the Youth uh, Technology and Jobs Project in 2020 in collaboration with the World Bank and in Tunisia to mention the Startup Act of 2018, which might be the world's first legal framework to grant aspiring entrepreneurs year-long leave extendable to two years to set up a new business. Now, this contrast is intentional, of course, to talk about the watershed in terms of the decline in the scientific enterprise in the Islamic world and some of the more recent initiatives that have been implemented by countries recently to rise or raise the level of the scientific enterprise in Muslim majority countries and in a number of Arab countries. Another indicator of contemporary relevance is normally the GERD, the gross expenditure on research and development. And this is another slide extracted from UNESCO, from the UNESCO Science Report, that shows a slight increase in the gross expenditure on research and development as a percentage of GDP in the majority of Arab countries, that is between the years 2014 and 2018. So there are a number of positive signs as to um, what is happening on the landscape of science, technology, and innovation in general in um, uh, Arab and, and Islamic countries. But what is the picture now today in terms of what is on the radar today? That is, apart from the COP26 summit that uh, uh, we witnessed or saw yesterday that talk about, talked about bridging the divide between science and decision making. I think for the first time uh, we, uh, we have seen politicians acknowledge that it is time to listen to the voice of science in uh, scientific decision making. Another item that is very much on the agenda these days, of course, is the SDGs, the 2030 Agenda on Sustainable Development. And of science and technology, because science, technology, and innovation is cross-cutting across the SDGs. The scientific elements that are critical to the achievement of the SDGs that need to be introduced to any, by any country if the said country is to achieve the parameters outlined in the SDGs. And also, again, science is too important to be left to scientists alone or to politicians alone because it's science is a vehicle an excellent vehicle to build bridges between cultures and this is again what was referred to yesterday in the uh, uh, the statement of the british prime minister when he acknowledged that it was high time to listen to the voice of science when uh, taking a decision concerning uh, people, concerning health, concerning the environment, concerning climate change. And also, I think yesterday within this forum, we've, ho we've heard how uh, uh, space sciences and research can address a number of uh, mainstream uh, issues, including the 2030 Agenda on Sustainable Development, the SDGs, and the we have the water, energy, health, agriculture, and food security, biodiversity, and climate change. And I, I think we have seen a number of excellent examples of activities that have been or are being implemented today in such domains. 
I will try and focus on the other domains that I've not noted, I've not uh, seen addressed thus far by the various speakers. Essentially, capacity building and contribution to world civilization and attempting to address life's big questions as well as international cooperation. Uh, the mainstream stakeholders that I've uh, that are of note, of course, are the national uh, government uh, space agencies uh, that uh, are uh, operating uh, in the Islamic world, uh, 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 including in Algeria, Azerbaijan, Bahrain, Bangladesh, Egypt, Indonesia, Iran, Kazakhstan, Malaysia, Morocco, Pakistan, Saudi Arabia, Tunisia, Turkey. Turkmenistan, UAE, and Uzbekistan. Now, I may have uh, forgotten a couple of uh, newly founded space agencies, but um, um, I stand to be corrected if I have. And also some of the um, agencies operating at the regional level to address and um, build up the national and regional capacities in, in, in uh, space SDI. And such agencies, the, the activities that such agencies have been undertaking over the last uh, uh, 20 years or so, essentially science, technology, and innovation. is in Middle Eastern countries. There is an example from Algeria that um, involves improving telecommunications, essentially by launching uh, the mission in Kuwait uh, that talks about the Kuwait space program, which was founded in 2018, and in Saudi Arabia, which U.S. dollars by 2030 to boost its space program strategy. Dr. Zobi, are you still with us? We lost you. I think we lost the connection with the Dr. Zobi. If this is the case, we, we move to the next speaker. Uh, Rod, are you there? Road pile. Road pile is there. Road, are you online? Yes, I am. Okay, then we are gonna have you next. We, we unfortunately okay. we lost the connection with our previous speaker. So if this is the case, we move further. Uh, road pile. Let me have an opportunity to introduce to you the Road Pile is a space historian and author. He is a space author, journalist, and historian who has authored 17 books on space history, exploration, and development for major publishers and the NASA that have been released in 10 languages. He is the editor-in-chief for the National Space Society's quarterly print magazine, Ad Astra, and his frequent articles have been appeared in Space.com, Life Science, Futurity, Huffington Post, Popular Science, Caltech's e &S Magazine, and Wired. He has written extensively for NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory and Caltech, including the technology highlights 
for NASA's jet propulsion. We are very much happy that he is with us today and he will furnish us with his thoughts. You will see that he has really uh, assembled his points, the questions to discuss with you people today from his point of view. So the road, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Thank you, distinguished colleagues and representatives. My warmest regards to you all, and thank you for my inclusion in these important proceedings. I really believe that your work here will do much to broaden the conversation about cultural inclusion in space activities, and it's an honor to be included. I'd like to start by citing my friend Buzz Aldrin, Paul Levin Moonwalker, who kindly wrote the following in his introduction to my 2019 book, Space 2.0. He said, Within a few years, I see private investment taking a leading role in space efforts. Internationally, China has joined the United States and Russia in human spaceflight, and India has taken an active role in planetary exploration. Others will follow. This is music to the ears of any former spacewalker, moonwalker, along with the millions of others who see a bright future in space. That was written in 2017, so a lot's happened since then, including a lot of space-related accomplishments that uh, originated in your part of the world. But I, I, I read that because I think Dr. Aldrin is correct. International space agencies, along with private space companies and NASA, really will lead the way in space exploration in the 21st century. So to address the long-term implications of this partnership, the question I want to ask today is what, the following. What form of blended governance and social structure will offer the best chance for international partners to prosper in off-Earth settings? whether on the moon, on Mars, or in orbit, or in free space? How can people of different governmental and cultural traditions best coexist over the long term and find maximum success in space? Let me look back a little bit at the history of multinational entities in spaceflight. During the space race years, roughly 1960 to 1972, the United States and the Soviet Union operated their space efforts generally under military operational models. In the US, it was a civilian program. In the Soviet Union, it was a semi-civilian program. But they operated along military lines because the astronauts and cosmonauts all came from military backgrounds. So that was the nature of spaceflight at that time. Then in 2000, we started sending crews to the International Space Station, which has operated on a civilian multinational model for 20 years. And this system of cooperation has worked very well. but these are, these are short-term deployments for individuals and really not a true test of internationalism over the long term. So what about long-term spaceflight and permanent off-world habitations of, of uh, people living in these, these environments? We know that traveling to Mars will probably take at least seven months each way. Crew members will stay there for many months or years, far from familiar surroundings, and we must do everything possible to accommodate individual and societal and cultural needs, including behavioral and religious needs. Uh, can I have my first slide, please? I did one Venn diagram for Space 2.0, because I'm not a big fan of diagrams. Uh, hopefully that slide will come up in a moment. And it's three circles overlapping in the center. In the left lower circle is NASA. Uh, indicating one of the larger space agencies in the world. In the right lower circle is the private sector and commercial space flight, offering many strengths in their own ways. And then finally in the top are international space agencies. Where these three circles overlap is where I believe our greatest strength is. And that's a strength of human opportunity, the opportunity for all of us to offer our best to this great endeavor. So what this means is competition between companies, but cooperation between nations, bringing out the best in these entities. So how do we look ahead? What ideas do we have about what society might look like in space? We've seen a lot of television and read a lot of books, many of us, science fiction mostly, that uh, try to project what different societies might look like in the future. Of course, one of the best known is Star Trek, which has been running for over 50 years now. And in that future, it is a, a federation of planets working in peace. Uh, they are no longer driven by financial motivations. For the most part, everybody gets along, except for the occasional battle with the Klingons or some other evil people. And that's the model we'd like to see. 
On the other extreme, we see shows, television shows and books like the Expanse series in which the darkest of human nature is brought forward. There's conflict and there's jealousy and there are great challenges. And it might be said that the Expanse is more indicative of what we see of human nature on our planet, but the Star Trek is, model what we, Star Trek is the model we strive to achieve. And, and there's that, that bench chart. thank you. So in the center is, is where we'd like to see the good things happen between those three forces. I'd like to talk for a second about academic studies that have addressed the same topic, what will human societies look like off Earth? And for the ones I've read, and I've read many of them, the primary flaw I've seen is that much of that work maintains the assumption that the Western societal governance and social values will, will rule over what's done in space. And this is not necessarily a bad thing. It's a model that's worked quite well to date when it is included in international cooperation in a thoughtful way. But I do believe a conversation must be had about increased cultural inclusion from all cultures and parties involved. There are legal and societal trends that have not been sufficiently addressed, in my opinion. The most realistic off-world habitat models, in my, in my view, parallel current Antarctic operations, where we have separate national bases or nodes with a collective research hub. So there are, there are stations all around Antarctica. The United States has a couple. Russia has a number of them, China, Japan, Great Britain, Chile, Argentina, Japan, India, Pakistan, and many others. The people tend to live and work on their own national territory within that station, but they also then collect at places like the South Pole base that is run by the United States to research and live together for shorter periods of time. Um, this offers cooperative support for research opportunities and common support in case of emergencies. But in this case, the time spent in that cooperative environment is still limited, usually to a matter of months. So after that period of time at the Antarctic base, and, and I'm taking this knowledge from a number of dear friends of mine who have spent many years there, most of the foreign nationals can't wait to get back to their individual uh, Antarctic research stations to live under their own societal norms, speak their language, eat food that they love, and be able to engage in their traditional customs and behaviors. But they do still operate in cooperation for achievement and safety. So like Antarctica, the space environment is hostile and must be faced with a common goal of safety and assured survival. As I wrote in Space 2.0, space hates people, and it's important that we protect ourselves in space at all times. So moving this conversation into space, we have some important considerations of how we include cultural ethnic needs in long-term habitats. One is operational cost. One crew hour in the, in the uh, International Space Station, for example, is about 140,000 US dollars. So that's about 1.4 million US dollars per day per person. A 10 minute break, for, for example, for prayer, if you choose to do so, would end up costing about $24,000. Preparation of ethnic foods would also cost in terms of time and resources. Now, all these needs have been accommodated on the International Space Station at one time or another, and at least one American astronaut took time for prayer on the moon during a moonwalk. But for longer term deployments, crew assessment and socialization skills will be critical for people to be able to get along and accommodate each other's needs in a thriving and positive way. These societal norms will cost in terms of time and money, but are vitally important for the long-term mental health of the participants. These national goals may challenge to a degree some Western norms of oversight and social conduct, which have been put in place for hundreds of years. But these other societies, many of them, including many represented today, have societal and governmental norms dating back thousands of years, and these must be observed and included. Let's go back to that Venn diagram, if we could. Previous slide, please. Uh, two or three back, where it says opportunity in the center. Um, once again, I wanna look at that slide for just a moment, see where those three circles overlap, because I wanna talk about financial and achievement opportunities for emerging space participants. And in addition to living together in space, we will be working there, providing goods and services to the new space economy and partner nations. What are some of the opportunities for emerging space partners? Well, let's look at at capacity for carrying things to other worlds. SpaceX's Starship, if things go as planned, will soon be delivering upwards of 91 metric tons of cargo, that's 91,000 kilograms, to the moon 
for an estimated one tenth to one one hundredth of conventional launch costs. This isn't pie in the sky, this is the real thing. A flight rate of once per month, possibly more, is uh, not unreasonable to assume in the next couple of years. At this point, neither NASA nor anyone else currently has plans to confill that capacity. That is a big pipeline, and we've got a lot of cargo that's going to be heading up into space to the moon, to low Earth orbit, and we need to have things to do there. So I think this is a moment of great opportunity for state actors, both private and public, with access to high tech, but without substantial launch capability, which would be the case with a number of smaller international space agencies. Developing space for the betterment of humanity is no longer just about rockets and landers. Thousands of different systems and hundreds of specializations will be critical. Every society, country, and culture has ideas in which they excel and show strength. Examples include the Indian Mars Orbiter Program and the United Arab Emirates Hope Mars Orbiter currently operating at Mars. These were the fourth and fifth national programs to reach the Red Planet, an undertaking that I remind you has had a roughly 50% failure rate, which is very massive. This is a glowing indicator of our time and shows the strength of international brilliance and contributions to space partnerships moving ahead. It's critically important that we recognize the value of internationalism in spaceflight, abandon 20th century notions of nationalism, and work together to provide the best possible future for humanity. I want to thank Assesco for putting together this important conference. I hope that such events will lead to true international cooperation in space for the benefit of all of us. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Rod, for giving an overview of uh, 2.0 cultural expression of world communities. Ladies and gentlemen, our next speaker is Marco Ferrazzani. Uh, Marco Ferrazzani is the European Space Agency's legal counsel and head of legal services department at European Space Agency at headquarters in Paris, France. In this position, Marco is responsible for leading the legal services of European Space Agency for assisting the Council of Member States and executives in their decisions by providing legal advice and for defending ESA in the courts. Marco provides a full spectrum of legal advice and guidance on the legal and programmatic aspects of European Space Agency programs and policies. He is the legal advisor to the ESA Director General and to the ESA Council of all institutional and legal matters, including the interpretation of ESA Convention and all relevant legal instruments. He also provides the legal counseling to the agency's organs and member states on all legal matters, including defending the rights of agency, preparing draft agreements, and conducting international negotiations identifying the agency's legal liabilities and devising legal solutions to mitigate them and preparing resolutions, declarations, and other legal instruments for the execution of agency's programs. He is specialized in international law, international organizations, space programs, and European affairs. We are happy that he is today with us to talk on the European Space Agency experiences in international space programs. We especially requested him to give his viewpoint from the, from, the, from the law point of view so that our audience can see that what the space and where it, it, it resides. Sir, thank you very much that you are with us. So we are happy to hand over the floor to you. Excellencies, uh, dear colleagues and friends from uh, all over uh, the scientific community. It is uh, good morning to all you, salam alaikum, and it is my pleasure and honor to address you today, uh, showing the experiences of international space programs and how much they bring value on international uh, collaboration, scientific results, and economic achievements. If I can please uh, share the screen, I will uh, give you a presentation of uh, um, our work uh, and our uh, way of working in Europe for space. Um, can you just tell me if you can see the, uh, the screen, please? Yes, yes, we do. Yeah, it's perfect. Oh, okay. Thank you. 
Um, I come from the European Space Agency. It is, uh, uh, it is our experience, it is our statement that cooperation is the key of the uh, international space program. First of all, the objective is to grant prevent outer space from becoming an area of conflict. We do it for civil purpose with the idea of international cooperation, but also to distribute the benefits from space research and experience. And ultimately to advance the exploration and use of space um, on efficiency of resources. The purpose of the European Space Agency is to provide and promote for uh, cooperation among European states for peaceful purposes for space research and application. So cooperation among European states is our first and foremost objective. And that's what we're doing in the last 50 years. It is an international governmental organization established by a treaty with international personality, with more than 2,000 staff in European centers, and around six and a half billion euro budget this year. So it's quite substantial level of investment from European states with the host agreement in seven centers around European states. And you can find the distribution of where we are uh, around in Europe. In reality, we are in Europe, but we're also in outer space and in many countries around the world. Uh, we have 22 member states and associate agreements with many, um, first of all, with European Union we work for, and many international cooperation partners, among which uh, prominent is Canada and many others. In Europe, the way we arrange space we have fundamental um, distribution between the national governments of the European Union who define the political priorities and give the financing, European Space Agency who undertakes research and development for space science and developing technology program, uh, program management, so managing the programs, and industry to whom we let uh, contracts to develop, manufacture, operate and give services and develop new services in outer space. ESA is one of the few space agencies in the world with programs across all areas of space activity, covering all areas from science to telecommunication, exploration, observing the Earth, and operations. It's a complete program agency to the benefit of our member states and the users, users worldwide, we are, because we have many areas in which our data policy gives free access to anyone in Europe and around the world outside of Europe. Some example of space missions for space science, you may remember Gaia or uh, the landing on the comet, uh, Churi, uh, and the Copernicus program, Sentinels, which are providing uh, uh, unparalleled level of definition and quality of data for the Earth uh, uh, observation. Uh, ESA and European Union jointly developed the, and operate today the program Galileo for positioning and timing. Uh, we have many examples of participation in international space cooperation, where ESA represents Europe in the International Space Station, uh, the Hubble T Space Telescope, which we worked with many years with NASA, and very soon, just a month from now, we will launch the next telescope. James Webb uh, Space Telescope is going to be launched just next month from Kourou with Ariane, and that's a collaboration with NASA and ESA. We launched from the European Spaceport the uh, rocket Soyuz for many, many times. And the next mission to Mars is ExoMars, where for the first time ever, we'll be able to go and search for traces of life below the surface of Mars. That's next year. Uh, ESA is an actor of international cooperation. That's what we live for. So cooperation is central for ESA. First of all, with our member states, 22 in Europe, with international organizations and institutions around the world, and with governments and organizations also of non-member states. To do that, uh, just to give you an example, International Space Station has been a model for the last 30 years, since the signing of the first government agreements 30 years ago, of an international civil outpost in outer space. And that's a model also how we live and work together in space with crews from many different countries, with a common uh, goal. And uh, thanks to uh, the previous speaker, Rod Pyle, I can give an analogy to uh, how we live in the death station with the stations in other places out of jurisdiction like Antarctica, where different crews work very well together. They, have, they maintain their nationality, their objectives, but they really work together even in moments where on the ground, some of this country may have uh, um, different views and tensions they still work very well uh, for international uh, civil cooperation. 
So it's a permanent uh, outpost that works in, in accordance with international law and cooperation for peaceful purposes. The next uh, step on the basis of the experience of the space station is to build what we call a gateway, which will be a smaller station orbiting around the moon to enable research and also descent and operations on the surface of the moon. And this picture gives you an idea who is working to build that. We already have concluded agreements with NASA and with the other uh, agency that you see here. And these are the modules that you see in the, the ESA logo is building three parts of this future gateway um, orbital station together with NASA, the Japanese JAXA and the Canadian Space Agency. So this is something which is happening right now to be launched starting 2024 to enable them descent on the surface of the moon. Another long uh, reaching and ambitious program is to go on the surface of the Mars and be able to bring back sample. So it's called Mars Sample Return. It's a quite complex mission, again, ESA and NASA, uh, to be able to bring back samples and, and then able to study them uh, back on the surface of uh, our planet in laboratories. How do we do that? We do it through multilateral and bilateral agreements. It may take different forms, uh, memorandum of understanding or technical guidelines. It is actually my work to understand well the requirement of scientific uh, colleagues, the requirements of government policies and objectives, and formalize them through different kinds of agreement, depending if it's a wide collaboration, if it's specific to one mission, if it's specific to a set of data, which I repeat, in our scientific data policy, we give it open and uh, free uh, to all scientific community. The data and information from missions in science, from the Comet and others are all available and delivered uh, freely by our uh, data centers. Uh, ESA is an agency that has uh, relationship and agreements with many different partners around the world. Everybody wants to have agreements with ESA because our openness and our model of uh, open collaboration. We have concluded more than 500 international agreements with states, international government organization, space agency, industry and partners around the world, both public and private investors. First with the European Union, we have long-standing cooperation with what one may call the, ma the main space-faring powers, <coughs> China, Russia, USA, Japan, Canada, and with many countries in South America, African states, Asian Pacific. But what my point today is that the space activity, of course, are very complex. They're very intensive and expensive, uh, very risky, uh, and we need to maintain them in a sustainable way, this is the motto of today, sustainable uh, and responsible states for space operation to guarantee a safe uh, future of operations uh, around the Earth. And that's an objective itself. So not only uh, space flight is complex uh, and, uh, and needs a very um, refined and experienced engineering solution, but also we need the force of law to maintain a certain uh, level of sustainability and safe uh, use of outer space. And that's another chapter is opening today. The United Nations have adopted 21 guidelines on long-term sustainability of space, which we have, uh, of course, uh, followed closely. And actually, we have adopted internally to follow and implement all of them. Uh, and that's why we participate, ESA participates as a permanent observer in the UN Committee on the Peaceful Use of Outer Space that takes place uh, every year in the UN offices in Vienna. Uh, ESA adopts and applies the principles of uh, UN and also space law from the treaties on a daily basis. That's part of my work, to uh, maintain that the European space operation are in accordance with the law and with the best uh, principles. And also, ESA, uh, actually my office, assists the member states that would like to establish and implement national space legislation, which is necessary to translate international guidelines and treaty obligations into actual programs and national laws. And that's a trend which is still not completed. Many states have national space law, others don't, or just have incomplete laws or need to be completed. And that's why we do a lot in terms of both awareness 
to explain to politicians and governments what are the principles of space, of international uh, peaceful cooperation, and how to adopt it and, and uh, align space program missions to that. This is, uh, shows where we are today for a European uh, space vision on the long term. Today, in 2021, uh, ESA is preparing uh, a, a European political process for formulating uh, these principles and new programs in a meeting at ministerial level, what we have scheduled and called to have in Portugal, in Porto, uh, now in November, in a few days, on the 18th of November. There is now intense stakeholder interaction among the European governments and states. <coughs> Sorry, which will lead us to a, a European Space Summit, which is already scheduled for February 2022, where uh, European governments will define uh, a long term objectives for space sustainability, for programs and for also uh, introducing a more um, complete approach in terms of having private investors calling to work alongside our programs in what we call public and private partnership. Uh, it's also what we call uh, an evolving uh, of a European space governance between European Space Agency, European Union and all the member states. Uh, there is already a definition to introduce new flagship programs, both for space to support uh, what we call in Europe the Green Deal policy, so having a better, uh, more enlarged use of space data to support active policy for the Green Deal. That's uh, a, a fundamental priority that we will prepare for the Space Summit of February 22, and also for uh, setting up uh, uh, a program to uh, ensure that our space assets are uh, feasible and working and they provide rapid response to uh, challenges on the earth and for the citizens. And this is to end up with uh, what is planned to be the ESA Ministerial Conference at the end of 2022 to uh, adopt and finance all the programs. That's where the famous 6.5 billion per year come from. Commitment, long-term commitments, which are done always in an international setting among European states, uh, committing on multi-year uh, program and financial commitments, which is quite a refined system that we have experienced so in Europe and allows our member states and our partners around the world, the one I mentioned before, to rely on ESA as a trustful partner for long-term programs, both long-term objective programs and space sustainability. So in conclusion, I want to just uh, underline how much ESA is a mechanism of international cooperation for outer space of activities in the form of international government organization, but also itself ESA becomes an actor in space, in outer space activity, complying fully uh, with the idea of international cooperation and with the best practices. Uh, and we do that uh, around the world, always stating that our instruments are compliant with international law and with the idea of funding cooperation. So it is our ideal um, motto and uh, principle and device, international uh, cooperation for peaceful purposes. Thank you all for your attention. Thank you very much, Marco, for such a kind words and also it's a beautiful presentation we are really thankful for your intervention ladies and gentlemen we move towards the next speaker and then uh, dr monif is also again with us and then after uh, professor elchin babayev we will give him the floor to uh, complete his, his presentation uh, now the floor i'm going to give to professor elchin babayev is another distinguished speaker Professor Elchin Babayev is the rector of Baku State University, Azerbaijan. In addition to his responsibilities as a rector of Baku State University, Dr. Babayev is the executive director of Science Development Foundation under the President of Republic of Azerbaijan. Professor Babayev is astrophysicist and also deputy director on scientific affairs and deputy head of the Scientific Council Shemaki Astrophysical Observatory, Azerbaijan. He's also at the National Academy of Science, Deputy Editor-in-Chief of Astronomical Journal of Azerbaijan. I'm really pleased to give him the floor to talk on 
space weather research in Azerbaijan challenges and perspectives. Sir, floor is yours. Thank you very much, uh, Excellencies, dear colleagues. At first, I would like to thank uh, ICSP officials and other organizers for inviting me uh, to present in such a high level event here. Uh, using this opportunity, I would like to give a, a brief summary about our activities. My country, Azerbaijan, is located in South Caucasus and is usually called gate between Europe and Asia as we have a mixture of both cultures. And in Azerbaijan, uh, the main organization uh, dealing with astronomical and space research applications, teaching and space weather studies, uh, Baku State University, having the Department of Astrophysics, as well as Astrospace and Atmospheric Research Lab within our Excellence Center. Besides, we have two astrophysical observatories located in different locations in Azerbaijan, the Shamafi and Batabat observatories. And yesterday, you have heard about Azerbaijan Space Agency, it's a public legal entity, and we have National Aviation Academy, National Aerospace Agency, and some research institutes under Azerbaijan National Academy of Science and some departments in different uh, universities. So in this map, you can see where they are located. And uh, this is our Baku State University, the main building. This is Shamahi Astrophysical Observatory with two meter German origin Carl Zeiss Jena telescope. This is Batabat Astrophysical Observatory on High Mountain Observatory. Other Cosmos. This is National Aviation Academy. And what we are doing? So we are studying solar physics, both theoretical and experimental, helioseismology, global solar oscillations, solar terrestrial physics, and space weather effects studies. So I would like to mention that these uh, studies particularly cover some tasks of international programs and projects like impact on technologies, either space on, on Earth, and public health problems and environmental problems. So as I mentioned already, we are conducting this research in Department of Astrophysics and in Department of Cosmic Plasma and Halo Geophysical Problems at Shamafi Astrophysical Observatory. Activities include monitoring and analysis, theoretical and experimental studies of space weather effects, application of obtained results in the industry, in public health and security, preparation of young specialists and public awareness. So uh, these studies uh, are made mainly in two directions. Uh, this influence on technical and engineering system, like electric power supply grids, oil production activity, bomb pipelines, and uh, effects on human life and health and as well as uh, ecological systems. Besides, we study very low frequency uh, electromagnetic waves propagation in the Earth's ionosphere and uh, investigation of solar wind magnetic field distribution near the Earth and uh, other uh, studies like the uh, contrast of solar coronal holes in the sun and parameters of the solar wind streams. So, uh, here, uh, I will not stop on this because we need uh, data handling, we need uh, equipment and uh, coordinated observations. Uh, we have uh, good collaboration with different countries and the clusters, so-called clusters, uh, from Greece, Russia, Bulgaria, uh, Belgium, United Kingdom, United States, uh, United States uh, and Germany. Uh, the solar stats uh, are uh, being carried out uh, by using our telescopes and as well as uh, theoretical studies like the theory of propagation and transformation of magneto hydrodynamic waves uh, in plasma. Uh, here uh, we are solving uh, different very complicated uh, equations 
and after that, uh, uh, trying uh, to apply uh, this result uh, in astrophysical situations. And uh, concerning the space weather effect studies, uh, we have very good results in the field of uh, study influence of functional state and bioelectrical activity of the human brain. Uh, mainly, they are uh, geomantic storms. Uh, we are using uh, different uh, techniques, uh, uh, including the classic ways, portable and complex, uh, and at the same time, both uh, approach. We are registering electroencephalograms and uh, studying the brain waves, uh, and uh, of course, uh, we are connecting them with Schumann resonance uh, in the ionosphere. Uh, we are getting such uh, registration of the waves, and after that, we are uh, mapping uh, different uh, cartograms, uh, comparing uh, them for uh, geomantic storms and for uh, geomantically quite, uh, quite uh, conditions. Uh, of course, I am not going to here to describe the results, uh, but uh, these papers are published in the level of the impact factor journals. Uh, besides, uh, we are studying the effect on human cardiovascular health states uh, in different locations on Earth. And for that purpose, uh, we are using indirect indicators. Uh, they are temporal distribution uh, of different uh, data particularly the hospital admissions and industrial and traffic accidents. And uh, of course, for this, we are applying different mathematical approaches and statistical methods. Also, we are uh, collecting data for direct inverters when uh, we are uh, conducting daily cardio experiments using the, the permanent group uh, of uh, people uh, and with different ages and with different uh, uh, level of uh, NGFC and of course uh, in this case also we are using uh, the huge data of the database. Uh, for us uh, most interesting is uh, to study uh, earth rate values because they are also important for astronauts and also uh, we are comparing this uh, obtained results uh, on the earth with special rooms, uh, isolated rooms and we are registering uh, different uh, uh, cardiograms here uh, and uh, for different uh, purposes uh, we are using different types of uh, geomagnetic storms uh, with high speed solar wind streams and magnetic clouds so uh, we are conducting this uh, uh, studies for different location on the earth just to uh, uh, compare results uh, at our experiments. Uh, by the way, uh, we have studied the dynamics of new incidents uh, for different periods, and uh, they could be used for the future for different uh, pandemics here. And uh, we have studied the impact on power distribution system. We found some major periodicities here, and uh, we also consider the scintillation activity for uh, L1 and L2 uh, frequencies here. We have a space weather uh, center in observatory. Uh, we have established here a awesome receiver, a VLF receiver. Uh, we are uh, part of the Stanford uh, program, registering for different sites. Uh, also, we have uh, established here uh, super seeds, sudden ionospheric disturbances measuring for different conditions with fly solar flares and no flares. Uh, we have uh, induction magnetometer, uh, horizontal solar telescope. And uh, here I would like to mention some scientific events uh, that we have uh, held uh, in Azerbaijan as uh, international events. And one of them is the Baku Solar Conference. International conference on uh, from astro seismology to space weather. Uh, they have been published uh, in France. 
and the papers. Also, recently we had the uh, International Space Weather Initiative uh, GNS School uh, in Papua with a uh, big participation of uh, uh, eminent scientists uh, from and uh, students. And also we had uh, international workshop on actual problems of solar terrestrial physics, also uh, with international participation. So we are paying uh, much uh, attention to public awareness here. Uh, we have a uh, planetarium also in Papu, and also we are using uh, the young generation to celebrate the space days. Uh, I have heard uh, told about the international uh, operation here. Uh, and uh, of course, the collaboration is that we are looking uh, uh, and uh, using different uh, uh, ways, uh, and one of them could be there, our cooperation uh, within uh, ICS activities. Uh, by the way, we have established a good ties with uh, ICS. I would like to thank uh, once again the, uh, uh, the Director General uh, and uh, also our other friends from ICS. And uh, just a few, uh, one month ago, we had the uh, first ICS workshop on fundamentals of instrumentation and reverse engineering. And it was a very good uh, event. and. Uh, we do hope that in future we will uh, continue our collaboration, also establishing uh, the ICS chair uh, in our university and uh, biomedical uh, research lab in the university. Uh, with this, I would like to finish my presentation. Uh, thank you very much once again, and uh, shukran. Thank you very much, Professor Babayev. Uh, we are just going to give um, uh, Professor, uh, Dr. Monif for, for floor for five minutes, Dr. Monif, to finish your talk. And then uh, there is a one question after Dr. Monif's uh, presentation to Professor uh, Babayev, our, uh, one of our participants. They want to have one question to Professor Babayev. So we, we give the floor to uh, Dr. Monif. Dr. Monif, floor is yours. Please try to uh, wind up in five minutes. Thank you very much. Floor is yours, sir. Thank you very much. I hope you can hear me OK. Yes, we hear you. Thank you. Um, well, actually, it's a little bit fortunate that I'm speaking after the gentleman from Azerbaijan and the um, uh, the uh, Dr. Ferrazzani from the European Space Agency, because what I'm going to say right now uh, actually uh, uh, fits in uh, with what they have uh, uh, said. Um, and uh, I, I would mention that uh, most of the speakers in this forum have rightly focused on space science and technology applications and on the significance of space science in limiting risks of um, disasters and humanitarian crises, uh, as well as reducing poverty. Essentially, um, a, 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 a mainstream uh, activity um, emanating from the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development uh, and the 17 SDGs. Now, because space exploration is expensive and risky, to complete the space sciences value chain, it is important to focus on other pieces of the puzzle. Um, including uh, developing uh, a national vision. Uh, regional and international collaboration and the creation of science advisory mechanisms at the national level. STEM, education, science, technology, engineering, mathematics, and medicine, uh, uh, interest in STEM, and building the human and societal capital in science, technology, and innovation. In terms of the vision, I'll mention the famous vision of uh, President Kennedy, who stood before Congress on the 25th of May, 1961, and proposed that the U.S. should commit itself to achieving 
the goal before this decade is out of landing a man on the moon and returning him safely to Earth. Now, it's been claimed that uh, space activities are critical drivers of STEM education and that during the Apollo program, there was a dramatic increase in the number of students pursuing advanced degrees in STEM. In terms of advisors, I think part of the STI ecosystem in many countries lacks or STI ecosystems lack STI advisors to the head of state or the government. Um, uh, I will talk a, a little bit about that in a moment, but I would also mention regional cooperation as outlined by our friend from the European Space Agency and propose that the regional space policy helps to create jobs and boost economic growth and it expands the frontiers of science and research and addresses global challenges such as climate change fresh in our minds following the start of COP26 yesterday. Now, the UAE in this part of the world has led the process to establish the Arab Space Cooperation Group, which is the region's first body for space cooperation, uh, which was launched in 2019. It comprises 11 Arab countries, and its uh, first project involves developing a climate monitoring satellite, which, was launched, which will be launched in 2022. Uh, science advisory mechanisms are important. They're pivotal stakeholders in the national as well as the regional STI ecosystems. A uh, very famous photo of Professor Farouk Al-Baz uh, from Egypt and the US of NASA who for a, a while was a presidential science advisor to President Anwar Sadat of Egypt. Um, and this is my uh, concluding slide, if you like, uh, about building the human and societal capital. Uh, so what I'm saying is that as well as the mainstream activities that space agencies undertake nationally, regionally, and internationally, space science research activities can inspire students to become more interested in science, technology, engineering, mathematics, and medicine. And also, space exploration unravels the mysteries of life's big questions. Another factor that is important, particularly in developing countries, particularly in Middle Eastern countries, is science enthusiasm or the culture of science. Space research can put scientific ideas and scientific thinking in the public mind set and would nourish the culture of science in the public mindset. In this, I, I referred extensively to the book by James Schwartz, The Value of Science and Space Exploration, which actually ties in nicely with the task force in which I was involved that talks about the culture of science in the Islamic world. Lastly, uh, uh, the regional cooperation cannot be but a priority for all countries in STI in general and in space sciences in particular, because we all have to work to enhance north-south, south-south, and triangular regional and international cooperation on and access to science, technology, and innovation, and enhance knowledge sharing on mutually agreed terms, including through improved coordination amongst existing mechanisms, in particular at the United Nations level and through a global tech technology facilitation mechanism, such as the uh, Technology uh, Bank for Least Developed Countries, which I think needs to expand its mandate to include space science research. Thank you very much. So, thank you very much, uh, Professor Monif. Uh, actually, we are running out of time, but we are distinguished uh, the guests. We have two questions, one from the, uh, Mr. Nasser, there's a head of international cooperation, UA Space Agency, and one we have from uh, Majid al anazi So I want to know, um, Excellency, Dries Oisha is still there? Uh, 
Sir, are you on online? If not, then I give the, the floor to uh, Mr. Nasser to have a question to Baba Yev. And then I come to you, sir. Any question? Uh, yes, good morning, all colleagues, and thank you so much, uh, Dr. Sharif. I'll be uh, quick and brief. Uh, of course, first of all, I would like to thank and appreciate uh, Dr. Munif uh, for saying good words about uh, Arab space. Loudly, yeah, for saying good words about the Arab Space Cooperation Group. Yes, it is one of the uh, initiatives toward uh, deepen the collaboration, international uh, engagements uh, between the Arab states uh, in the region, 14 Arab states in the region. Uh, my question actually on this session, um, I've listened with great interest to the um, uh, previous distinguished speakers uh, talking about the uh, role uh, in international collaborations between the academia and industry, that is the academia industry partnership. And my question here uh, um, to, I mean, either the um, uh, Dr. Uh, Idris from Morocco or perhaps maybe Professor uh, uh, Babaev from uh, Azerbaijan. Um, as we know that there are benefits towards um, um, such academia, uh, uh, industry partnership, but there are always uh, some gaps as well uh, faced by any administration or faced by any space agency or a country. So uh, from his perspective in Azerbaijan, Dr. Uh, Babaev, if, if there are any gaps faced in, in such situation, could you maybe uh, briefly share um, or highlight um, those gaps that exist in Azerbaijan and how did you, uh, from your perspective, perspectives, how did you manage to resolve uh, these gaps between the industry and the academia in such partnership and engagement? Thank you. Professor Baba, so, I, I'm ready to answer. Please, sir, go yeah. ahead. Uh, thank you very much. It's an excellent question, and it's just on time, because uh, just a few months ago, we have established Excellent Center on Research Development and innovations. And within six months, we already started to earn money because we started uh, to apply our results in industry. And uh, it's no secret that I can tell you that we are uh, getting money within projects, uh, so BP, Soccer, uh, Other Gold, uh, Agro Dairy, and so on. So we already started this procedure. And uh, if you don't mind, uh, I'm ready uh, to invite you next year, because this is a pandemic period, uh, 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 to visit our excellent center. And we will be happy uh, to show and uh, to share our experience. Uh, before, of course, we had some problem because we are mainly oriented on uh, theoretical research. But now we already started to commercialize uh, our scientific results and through excellent center. It's the best way, I think. Thank you very much, Professor Babayev. I hope that you have the answer of the question. So I give the floor to uh, Mr. Majid el from Saudi Space Commission. Please, sir. Thank you, doctor. Um, I have two questions. One for Dr. Marco, if he's uh, still online. Dr. Marco? Yes, I'm here, ready. Yeah, uh, I've noticed in your presentation that Canada is part of the ESA and Canada is not European U uh, country. So at what capacity Canada is uh, participating in ESA and how other countries can join ESA if Canada is there? So my second question is to Dr. Manif. In your presentation, you mentioned the research uh, in, in the Arab world, the spending. In your opinion, what percentage from GDP should the Arab world spend on the research? Thank you very much. Please, Professor, Dr. Marco first, and then for Dr. Monif. Yes, yes uh, first of all, thank you for the interesting question, which allows me to come back to the model of ESA. European Space Agency is a model of regional cooperation for space programs. Mm -hmm. And actually, we uh, have experienced that model in the last 50 years, and we offer that model as an experience, how to build multilateral international space programs. So when we create a program, take a program to, uh, for space science or for Earth observation or for space weather, 
it is a multilateral agreement among European states. That's what I do uh, when I write this agreement. And in that multilateral system, the, we offer also participation to some close partner. With Canada, we have a cooperation agreement, government level, with the government of Canada since 30 uh, years. So they find a place in a European uh, system where each member state contributes a certain financial contribution, 3%, 5%, 1%. To make up the 100% funding of the program, we found, find also a place for Canada, who is not European, is not a member state, but can invest in European programs. So they can invest, say, a small percentage, and in return, they get back contracts in Canadian industry who learns to work together with European industry in a consortium. So Canada is an investor is a non-member investing in ESA programs and finding a fair return to their investment, both for their industry and for their scientific community. It's a very beneficial uh, modular system, quite open, quite reliable. And Canada has been investing Canadian dollars into European programs for many years. And this is possible. And we have various uh, kind of agreements around the world with many other states. Uh, so the ESA system is uh, quite open to uh, invite and introduce contributions from other partners. First, European states, of course, these are members, and then also add on additional contributions, which are usually financial contribution with a guaranteed return into the industry of the member state. It's a formula. It's a regional cooperation formula that we offer, and it wor has worked very, very well with the selected partners around the world. So it's possible. I'll be available to explain more bilaterally if anyone is interested or to have further discussion with us at ESA. Sure, we will, we will share your contacts with our audience. So the next question was to Dr. Monif. Dr. Monif, please, could you briefly respond? Thank you very much, uh, Chair. Thank you very much, Dr. Leonisi, for your question. Uh, uh, I think in the Arab and Islamic world, we've been talking about 1% of GDP as GERD, gross expenditure for research and development, uh, since uh, back in the 1970s. A target which was never achieved really by any uh, single Arab or Islamic state. Uh, uh, in 2003, the OIC proposed a target of 1.4% nationally and uh, regionally uh, as a percentage of gross expenditure on research and development. Uh, now, we have uh, two issues related to this. I think what is uh, very important is not only to set a percentage, but also to be able to develop the capacity to utilize the money that is allocated to research and development at the national level. Because in some countries, the money is there, but the capacity of the research community to utilize the resources is not there. So that is one issue. Uh, secondly, to answer your question specifically and quantitatively, I would say 1.5% is a good target to try to achieve at the national level. Uh, uh, and uh, at the national level also, I think it's important to have uh, a national monetary or monitoring agency that can calculate the expenditures on research and development. I, for example, only by chance discovered that Saudi Arabia was spending something like 0.82 of 1% on research and development um, when I was drafting the uh, Arab States chapter of the UNESCO Science Report. So we need three things. We need the reasonable target, 1.5%. To me, uh, looks uh, quite reasonable for the majority of Arab and Islamic countries. Secondly, we need to worry about the capacity uh, of the research community to utilize the funds. And thirdly, we need the national monitoring mechanism that can look at this file uh, completely, make sure the calculations are correct and the funds are uh, used according to international standards 
um, so that uh, uh, researchers such as myself who are into science policy can compare and contrast different countries. Thank you, Thank you very much, Dr. Monif. Thank you very much. I would say that uh, we should give really a plus to our the, the speakers of the first session for their kind contribution.